turn now to um, second line uh, treatment, uh, specifically uh, the same sort of patient, this youngish patient's been on bevacizumab uh, maintenance uh, for six months or so. The disease starts to progress, uh, uh, mostly bony disease. The patient's already been on um, a zoledronic acid in combination with the uh, chemotherapy. Roy. Uh, what are the standard options here? And uh, at this year's ASCO, we had a very interesting presentation uh, by uh, the Italian group on uh, Veristrat, looking at serum proteomics. What are your thoughts about that study, at least uh, insofar as uh, erlotinib second line would be concerned? Sure. So the patient's been getting pemetrexid. So um, well, actually, bevacizumab. This bevacizumab, particular patient, but yeah. already had pemetrexid in the past, right? And right. It's been so stopped. The, the two options we would have in the, in the second line setting would be docetaxel, which of course we've been using for many years, um, or erlotinib. Um, you know, uh, erlotinib is a, a wonderful drug uh, for patients with EGFR mutations. And uh, clearly, you know, it, it produces a PFS benefit, and, and we know that unfortunately patients will become resistant, but it's certainly a good drug in that setting. To use it in an EGFR wild type patient, I think the data. Um, you know, in my opinion, show that there really isn't that much benefit. I, I think that um, if you look at the, the trials that compare chemotherapy versus uh, an EGFR inhibitor in an unselected wild-type pa patient, uh, in fact, um, the most recent trial, Taylor trial, would suggest, you know, again, with some caveats, there are some issues re regarding that trial, that the chemotherapy is better. However, this Veristrad test, which we heard about in the PROS trial, is intriguing because what it, what it basically is is it's, it's a proteomic classifier by that. They, they look at a series of proteins and they measure them uh, and they create two groups, a Veristrat high and a Veristrat low group. And, and in the high group, the, the good group, um, they actually do see you know, more benefit from uh, erlotinib, whereas in the uh, Veristrat low or poor group, they see very little, if, if, if none. So I do think that classifiers like that could help us to determine which patients with EGFR wild type disease would benefit from um, erlotinib. That said, I think that it's still, uh, in my opinion, needing a little bit more validation, perhaps another prospective randomized trial. But, but it, it's clearly the way um, we'll need to go with these types of agents. Where there's no driver, um, we will, having a predictive marker like that would be very useful. So if you were considering using erlotinib in this patient, granted wild type uh, or quadruple negative as we talked earlier, uh, you would consider ordering that test before you made the decision. I guess it is I, commercially available. Yeah, I, I, I might take a peek at it though, quite frankly. I would probably use uh, docetaxel in this setting or more likely try to put this patient on a clinical trial. I, you know, we'll probably talk a little bit more about this, uh, about immunotherapy and some of the other agents. So I, I, I'm not that much of a fan of it. It's, it's certainly interesting. Also biologically, you know, we don't really know what are the proteins, you know, what are the mechanisms. Though you don't necessarily need to know that from a classifier. In fact, from our battle studies that we, we did at MD Anderson when I was there, uh, and can speak to this as well. We, we, you know, a number of classifiers came out of that that are helping to determine the, the wild type EGFR patients. So there are a number of these, these classifiers out there. They, they deserve a look. But, but I, for my money, I'd spend my money looking for new agents. New agents. And your thoughts uh, regarding so pros? I actually had a big problem with the pros study. Um, first, they didn't, when they presented this at ASCO, they didn't present the response rates. They didn't present progression-free survival data. They just said that, you know, in the very strat poor group, that they had a worse survival, um, overall survival, if they got the erlotinib. But the very, you know, but they contradicted themselves because in all the prior retrospective studies, they said that the Veristrat good group was predicted for benefit from erlotinib. This study that they presented did not show that. So it was a negative so predictor, it a but negative. it wasn't a positive predictor. Correct, yeah. <laughs> so I think that we don't really understand the proteonomic assay as well. You know, they say that there's eight protein peaks in the serum analysis. We don't know what they are. Look to be um, amyloid-like, or that's well, unclear. Well, it's I think it's mm -hmm. unclear. Mm -hmm. So, and then you know, if you look at the different populations, the Veristrat good group tends to be the really good prognostic group. You know, the women, the never smokers, the good performance status patients. Well, we already know that they're going to do well. The Veristrat poor group tends to be more men, squamous cell carcinoma, poor PS. So we have clinical factors that could potentially yeah, identify. Yeah. So I'm just not group. sure that we really want to put <clears throat> money into this when. You know, it's basically just going to be a little bit of a negative predictor for us. On the other hand, BR21 was really in an unselected population, granted against placebo, yeah. but did show survival advantage. And the interest trial, in contrast to Taylor, did not show any survival difference between chemotherapy. 
and, and a different EGFR TKI, but gefitinib versus uh, right. docetaxel. You know, it, it did show that they were rather equivalent, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I would say skeptically both equivalently bad. You know, I think it, it really shows we need more research <laughs> and, and, and drugs in this area. That was a comment from uh, some of the uh, um, questioners at the uh, uh, at ASCO, I, I believe. Right, not, not uh, in, a, in a bad way. I just think, you know, <laughs> as, as we all know, we're all working in research in this field. We shouldn't be complacent with results like that. We really need to look towards new types of therapy. Everett, in this patient who's been on bed maintenance and, and has now progressed, um, would you consider going back to the original regimen, uh, carbopam? I don't remember if you said uh, what the time interval was. Six months. Uh, six months. I think it could be considered, uh, definitely, particularly if the patient had a good initial response uh, and tolerated the drugs well. Uh, and I think that would be in there. I otherwise think docetaxel is an excellent choice and uh, would probably not personally use Veristrat, although I know colleagues who do use the test. And uh, I think a goal of finding a kind of a secondary marker, um, if mutations do not apply as a primary marker, uh, to then find a secondary kind of a classifier is a very good one. Uh, whether that should be very strat in the end, I'm not sure. And I think the idea um, that it isn't clearly enough separated from clinical features, um, that really what we need is multifactorial factorial analysis of this, is a, is a very good one. Uh, but definitely to answer the question, I think going back to the original regimen could also be an option. Would you consider going back to platinum and maybe cycling in a different uh, partner agent? like docetaxel <laughs> or um, another taxi. <laughs> it, it very much becomes individual at mm -hmm. that point, I agree, um, and has to do with uh, the patient's tolerance of, of treatment. Um, I think this is now a younger patient. 56, um, 57. No longer 77. From our standpoint, I think definitely a younger patient. <laughs> and uh, so yes, I, I think absolutely doublets should be considered. Are there any circumstances where you think about continuing the bevacizumab beyond progression? And not after what I said before. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, would you consider that? Or would you put somebody on a protocol that actually evaluated that? You know, in colorectal cancer, uh, that's actually been looked at in the context, uh, I guess, of uh, uh, one of the many 5-FU uh, bevacizumab-based uh, regimens, uh, second-line treatment either alone or con uh, continuous bevacizumab with that, and actually showed a survival advantage. Do you think that might potentially extrapolate to non-small cell lung cancer? So I think we've learned a lot from colon cancer, KRAS story, um, potentially BRAF, um, things like that, that don't necessarily correlate with lung cancer or associate with lung cancer. So we have to um, be careful about thinking that the data is the same across diseases. But I think we can learn from it. And if, this, if it was a clinical trial, I think it would be worth um, entering a patient on a clinical trial. I wouldn't do it as a Off, standard You wouldn't do it practice. outside as a clinical trial? No. But I think theoretically yeah. there are reasons why um, keeping bevacizumab on um, makes sense. Um, angiogenesis doesn't go away. Right. Right. So there actually is a trial that's called the AVA All trial. They have AVA Pearl, AVA All, uh, that's actually addressing that question, taking uh, patients who've gotten a bevacizumab combination. Um, you know, take your pick in terms of the doublet. Uh, they've gotten through four to six cycles. They're now on maintenance. They've had to have at least two cycles of uh, maintenance bevacizumab. And then at that point or beyond when they progress, Erlotinib, docetaxel, pemetrexid, plus or minus continuation of bevacizumab. It's an international trial. It's accruing really well in Europe, which is sort of ironic because bevacizumab isn't used that much <laughs> in Europe. Not accruing all that well in the United States, but I think, uh, as you point out, that question exists and will hopefully be answered by this trial. What about other...